Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is April 22nd, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, Hillary Clinton says if she becomes president, she will use executive orders to take your guns. Let the congregation say amen. Then, get ready for huge Obamacare premium hikes in 2017 along with stiffer penalties for those caught without health insurance. Plus, a recent story by the Financial Times confirms what InfoWars has been saying all along. The Islamic State was created in part by the Saudis. Release the 28 pages. Oh, didn't expect to see you here. You know, we've got Donald Trump entering the cultural pissing contest over who can use which bathrooms, and I think you really stepped in it. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. It was only a matter of time, but now that time has come, they are already picking the bones of Justice Scalia for his Supreme Court seat. And in particular today, they're not talking so much about who's going to fill the seat, but the things that they can fill that seat with. And we see Chelsea Clinton, the daughter of Mrs. Clinton, the presidential candidate, coming out and saying, let's take advantage of the situation to ram through our measures of gun control. It matters to me that my mom also recognizes the role the Supreme Court has when it comes to gun control. With Justice Scalia on the bench, one of the few areas where the court actually had an inconsistent record relates to gun control. They say they believe the next time the court rules on gun control will make a definitive ruling. And in that full clip, you'll notice that she talks about mom's demand of action in, you know, the whole gun grab agenda, as I call them, because the issue with these groups, especially not so much mom's demand of action, but the other group, uh, the Bloomberg group, the mayors against illegal guns or whatever they're called, uh, they were very disingenuous about their gun control views because while they'll say that we just want common sense gun reform and we want to get these illegal guns off the street, streets and all this stuff, if you actually go to their meetings as uh, one of the mayors did, we put this article up a couple years ago, he said uh, when you go to these meetings, they say they want to ban the guns. It's not just getting uh, fully automatic AK-47s off the streets. So, no, they're trying to ban the guns. Meanwhile, if you go ask Bloomberg himself, are you going to fall in line with your own gun control measures and dis, uh, disarm your security team? He says, oh, I'll, I'll get back to you. I have to think about it. And it's just the hypocrisy of these people. When you talk about these politicians, Mrs. Clinton, Bloomberg, uh, Chelsea Clinton, they go to events where they have private security. They're surrounded by bodyguards and secret service. I mean, they ride around in bulletproof vehicles for you know goodness sake. And they wanna tell you that you don't have the right to be protected. And they'll say, uh, well, you can have a gun, just like uh, with the Bloomberg group, you can have a gun, but once they get more guns off the street, well, uh, the police can protect you at this point. Meanwhile, they're still gonna have their bodyguards and the rest of it. And it goes for many of the pundits and the other people who wanna get rid of the firearms as well. But it wasn't just uh, Chelsea Clinton, the daughter who got in on this, Mrs. Clinton, she sat while a man talked and she let him speak his piece. And then she said, let the church say, amen. We need you to be able to use your executive powers to legislate that you can't carry guns in cars. You can't bring guns in buildings that are not uh, insured to carry them. You, we need executive powers that say that we will fight for life. We can't kowtow to the sons and daughters of Charleston Hessen. We must have a greater voice. Thank you for coming, and I will elect you. Vote. Let the congregation say amen. Now, I'm not going to judge the guy in that clip. I'm not sure what his circumstances are. Maybe he lost a loved one. Maybe he lives in a neighborhood with bad crime. I don't know. But the issue is when he talks about these sons and daughters, uh, descendants of Charlton Heston, however he put it there, it's a very wide grouping that is not accurate at all of the American gun owner. You have people from all denominations, all levels of income, background, race, religion. All these people come together for the American gun owner. Uh, it's not just, you know, some good old boys out there in the woods who like to hog hunt, though that is protected by your Second Amendment, just as your personal defense is protected by your Second Amendment. And to anybody who thinks that the police are going to be there all the time to protect you, I can just say personally, and I'm not even demonizing all cops when I say this, but when we went to Ferguson, Missouri, myself and Joe Biggs, we were standing outside the police station. And when I say outside the police station, I don't mean 
down the street, around the corner, at a Starbucks. I mean, like this camera is in front of me. That's the police station. I'm here in front of the police station. And behind me, where you see this picture of Mrs. Clinton, that's where the buildings that were being looted and robbed while the police stood there and watched while they had a full battle rattle, tactical gear, uh, five MRAPs, tear gas grenades, the whole nine. And they stood there and watched those buildings be robbed completely naked. We showed you the footage of that. So if you think the police are going to be there to protect you at all times, when they're there watching the crimes, they don't want to break formation to come and save you. A similar thing when we saw in Ferguson, uh, just a little bit further down the street, we went out to an area and uh, there were no police around. They had set up a blockade a couple blocks back. So they just watched as myself and Biggs went down there and people were shooting at the firefighters. Now, once again, they got MRAPs, they got guns, they got uh, tear gas, all that ready to go. And instead of going down there to defend the, the firefighters who were trying to put out the flames in the buildings, they told the firefighters to pull out. The firefighters had to leave so quickly that they left the fire hoses behind. And I'm by no means judging the firefighters. You know, they they got axes and chainsaws trying to get into these buildings to put out the fires. They don't have the means to defend themselves. But this is what I'm talking about. When they won't even defend their fellow first responders, what do you think is going to happen to you, the average citizen, if something like that happens? And we'll talk about that more a little bit in our broadcast when we talk about people preparing for riots and mass civil unrest. So that's my whole deal when you talk about the whole firearm issue. And when you really look at it and you get down to the brass tacks, you'll find out that the majority of people who get killed by firearms, at least in this country, are suicides. And when you think about all the measures that go along with suicide, uh, people die from suicide pills, slitting their wrist, uh, putting the, the hose from the, from the car into the window and they suffocate themselves. All manner of death, and I don't mean to be morbid here, but the simple fact is banning a firearm is not going to rid our society of suicide or any other problem. And now we actually see that uh, U.S. suicide rates are the highest they've been in 30 years. And they say that rise was particularly steep for women. It's also substantial among uh, middle-aged Americans. And they say the suicide rate for, for middle-aged women ages 45 to 64 jumped by 63%, 43% uh, for men in that same category, but they say uh, suicide rates for men in general are up. So when you talk about, you can ban anything you want. You can ban you know guns and pills and baseball bats, whatever. You're not getting to the root cause of why these people are committing suicide in the first place. Is it mental illness? Are they mad at the, at the boss at the job? Uh, a marriage falling apart? Any number of other things. Banning the instrument they use to harm themselves does not get rid of the circumstances that make them want to harm themselves in the first place. And that's the whole thing when you think about let's ban everything. Just like I, I give the example of that mom, I believe she was in Arizona that happened last year. It happens every year, but this is just one of the more notable examples. Uh, drowned her two young children in four inches of bathwater or whatever it was. Nobody said let's ban bathtubs. They say, no, this is a mentally ill woman who desperately needed treatment. Banning the water and banning the bathtubs would not bring those children back. The woman had deep psychological needs that were not being addressed. And let's say you do have some psychological needs and you go to the doctor. Well, your uh, Obamacare insurance rates may be going up next year and you may not have the uh, proper finances to help yourself out with those pills or anything else that you may need. Without venturing a specific percentage increase, the president and CEO of America's Health Insurance Plans said in an interview that the culmination of market shifts and rising health care costs will force stark increases in health insurance rates in the coming year. Now, Obamacare, in my mind, is somewhat of a tricky thing because if you look at uh, conservative websites and uh, news sites, they talk about it's the worst thing in the world. If you go to Democratic websites, they say it's the best thing since sliced bread. So you can take it for what you want. But when I look at masses of people in Florida being kicked off their plans, masses of people in California being kicked off their plans, uh, rates going through the roof, I don't really consider that a win for the American, uh, especially when you consider how it's supposed to be a free. You guys remember that it's supposed to be free. And then it went to affordable. And now it's like, we'll charge you whatever you want. Because you think about the fact that this is written by the insurance companies and it's like you, you let them set their own price. So what they're doing is fixing the market price. If you allow the insurance companies to set their own price, of course, they're going to take advantage of that loophole. And it's just things like this. If you go back to the Obamacare website, it was like, what was the phone number? 1-800-FU or something absurd like that. The site didn't work. Obama's even making jokes about it. He's like, yeah, I want, I made everybody get on this thing, but then it didn't work. And then they said, well, we're not forcing you to get on it. We're just gonna charge you if you don't get it. It's like uh, some Girl Scout 
comes to your house and say, hey, sir, would you like to buy some cookies? Say, no, little Susie, I don't want any. She's like, okay, well, I'll just uh, charge you for it anyway. That's pretty much the same thing they're doing with this healthcare system. And as we pointed out, it's not a glamorous deal. It's like you get a free pen, right? I, I got a pen right here. Now, this is a pretty good pen. You know, they probably got it from Office Depot or someplace like that. But if you go someplace and you get a free pen, you go to someplace they give you just one over the desk, you click it two or three times and the thing breaks. We've all had that happen to us. It's the same thing with these insurance plans. When you make these one size fits all, it's free for everybody. You're not getting the best quality of insurance. You're just getting what's available to you at that time. But uh, I guess just more people are going to have to be affected by this in a negative way for uh, the country to realize this as a whole. Now, let's talk about some things that are going on overseas. We saw recently that President Obama went and met with the Saudis. And now we see this story. Saudis admit that they created the Islamic State. A recent story by the Financial Times confirms something many of us have known for years. Daesh, a.k.a. the Islamic State, was created in part by the Saudis. According to the late Saudi foreign minister, IS was cobbled together in response to the Shia government in Iraq following the U.S. invasion of the country in the execution of Saddam Hussein, who got his start as a CIA operative. The Financial Times story, however, ignores the fact that the Saudis collaborated with the CIA and Pakistani intelligence to create the progenitor of the Islamic State, the Afghan Arabs. That would become Al-Qaeda. Other factions of the CIA organized the Saudi-funded Mujahideen, coalesce into another fanatical Wahhabi group, the Taliban. Now, I understand when you talk about all these various terrorist organizations, it's hard to keep them straight. And I'm, I'll be the first to say I don't do it right all the time. Actually, I saw this graph and it outlined them as like Boko Haram and Al Qaeda and the Taliban and all these other things. I'm sure you can find it online. Um, but basically, the takeaway from this is Saudi Arabia, the country that we're looking at for the 28 pages, is uh, involved in creating the Islamic State. And that's not to say that we ourselves are completely innocent. I remember that clip of, um, I believe it was Reagan. He was talking about the Mujahideen. And you guys can see that movie, Charlie Wilson's War. They talk about this. I'm not saying it's the most historically accurate movie, but in broad strokes, they address the situation. And there's that clip uh, of late Reagan in the news cycle where he's like, yeah, the, the Mujahideen, they have as much integrity as our founding fathers. Meanwhile, they're out there uh, after the war was done or they you know, got the victory or whatever they wanted in that area. They're out there you know, doing all types of horrible things with the weapons that we gave them. And that's the issue about it. When you give a foreign country a bunch of weapons, uh, they're not always going to act in the interest of the United States government. Well, I guess in some ways they were because they were promoting the business of war because we give them the weapons then we have to go fight them for it. Even Mrs. Clinton admitted that a few years ago. Today, we're fighting the people that we created many different years ago, but this cycle just continues and continues, whether it's Iran-Contra, whether it's ISIS and Al-Qaeda now, of course, the Mexican drug cartels, which we talk about often. It all comes from this, the business of war. Now, let's talk about some wars going on here in the United States of America, and that is the war on terrorism. Now, you guys recall, I guess it's been a month or so now, we've been talking about the San Bernardino phone. Uh, basically, the FBI wanted Apple to back end uh, one of their iPhones and allow the FBI to use it. And it wasn't just that one time deal. They wanted to set a precedent so they could come in anytime they want and hack the phones. But they eventually did it the hard way or what they wanted you to believe is the hard way. And the FBI is saying that they spent over $1 million to unlock the San Bernardino attacker's iPhone. Now, to me, this is a blatant waste of money for the simple fact that John McAfee of McAfee Antivirus Software, you probably heard of it, um, he got on national TV and told the FBI in very simple steps how they could hack into the phone with just simple devices that they could go buy at Best Buy or any electronics store. Meanwhile, the FBI, in the great show of bureaucracy, decided to go and pay a company over a million dollars to hack it for him when they were told step by step, point by point by a guy who knows something about antivirus software, how to hack into the phone in the first place. This is just bureaucracy at its finest. And it reminds me of that scene from Independence Day where the guy's talking about, hey, do you think they spend, you know, $100 on a hammer, $500 on a toilet seat? Well, actually, they do. Because you guys have heard the stories about the gold toilet seats. I'm not exactly sure if that's true or, or at least not true in this country as far as being in government institutions. But I do have this article dated from the L.A. Times back in 1986 about $600 toilet seats. So if you didn't know, yes, they do spend $500 plus on toilet seats. It's right there in the headline for everybody to see. 
And these are the type of things they do. This is bureaucracy at its finest. We have to spend the money, so let's just go waste it. And let's not do it on uh, giving our employees benefits or doing something else that would actually matter. No, let's go waste this money on $600, we're close to $700, toilet seats. It's real and it is spectacular. Now, something we've been talking about here recently is all the preparation for civil unrest. Uh, and to be fair, we have had a good amount of civil unrest here in this country as well as abroad. And now we see that China is unveiling their anti-riot security bot that will, that will patrol public spaces. And they say it has all types of uh, bells and whistles on it. It has biochemical detection and uh, it's capable of clearing explosives and on and on and on. And as I talk about these things, a lot of people say, you're fear pouring, you're throwing all this stuff out there. Hey, I'm just telling you the preparations that they're doing. It's just like a fire drill. You had a fire drill in elementary school because they thought it was possible in the near future you could suffer a fire in that building. And when I say of these people, they're doing drills at the football games and the music festivals, and they got these bomb sniffing robots running around. They think that it is a possibility in the near future that they could have some type of uh, activity go on. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying that's what they're preparing for. So there you go. Uh, you take that for what you will. And our final story tonight before we go into more special reports, this is a sign of the time, so to speak. Uh, you hear these stories about people with uh, this trans movement, you know, I self-identify as whatever. Now we have a 30-year-old man who self-identifies as a high school student. The guy is six foot nine, and he's out there dunking on all these little kids in Canada, the star of the basketball team. And it, it just amuses me to no end that this guy had to go back to high school to become a sports star. I mean, the guy probably could at least played in the D-League. He's a big guy, but uh, it's just uh, some food for thought before we go on to our other topics. So stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News, and we'll be back right after these messages. Eric Mancal Muller, in his own right, has exposed a lot of this over the years as well. So he's just tooting my horn when he gives us credit. He's one of the other hosts that has been willing to talk about a lot of these issues and discuss it. And he's somebody that I think knows more celebrities than anybody else out there uh, because he's been syndicated all over the country and been out in California when his career first launched to be one of the top shows in the country, even rivaling Howard Stern. So he joins us now. Mancal, always great to have you here with us, my friend. Really sad news about Prince. Alex, um... Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm walking through the streets of Chicago right now, my brother. Uh, I did replay where you talked about the blimps on my show, and I laughed at you, and I mocked you. Um, and, and I can't apologize enough. I was wrong about so much. You're, look, you're, you're so cutting edge. You're, show, you're so ahead of time. Um, and and uh, the stuff you say that sounds crazy today, in five, ten years, everybody's going to go, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, it, it just it becomes common knowledge. But you release these things, and uh, it's the truth. It's just amazing. Uh, I have a lot to tell you today. Uh, first of all, I believe – let me just go through a few quick things. I think Zika is uh, setting us up for something. They're creating a lot of fear with Zika. I know you'll cover it on your show, I believe, getting us ready for uh, voterless elections, and they'll, they'll try out Zika to, uh, to, to, to take our attention away from our, our freedoms being robbed. I went to see a Journey show, and Robert Fleischman, who wrote Wheel in the Sky, he's their original lead singer, uh, is absolutely uh, a huge fan of yours and and uh, told me some interesting stuff, wanted me to reveal uh, the hologram universe we're living in. We don't have time for that now. But um, uh, my big surprise for you has been ruined. How is that? Well, I, I told you about Billy, the lead singer of the Smashing Pumpkins, and I think he's one of the people that's dialed in. He's seen behind, uh, he's seen behind the curtain. And I'm talking stuff like, um, well, kind of like what you would see, I imagine, the way it's been described to me, like Kubrick's uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, Prince also talked to me about some of, these, uh, some of these parties. You call it the Illuminati. You call it the secret societies, the satanic uh, blood stuff. People wonder why Prince dropped out, and I believe it's because uh, he, was, uh, he was frightened of these entities, uh, these things like Beyonce and Jay-Z and all the others. You know, some people are, are not willing to sell their soul. And... Um, I think Prince began to shy away from that. So uh, two years ago, maybe three years ago, Prince came and, and wanted to see me and wanted to see my studio. We did not have uh, an extensive conversation. He did talk a lot to the girls, had beautiful women around me. He did talk a lot to the girls. He did eat food off our uh, craft services table. Uh, people had brought in food for us. I was shocked. He kind of hung out and talked to everybody with me. It was pretty much he looked around the studio, looked at my equipment, was sizing me up. I didn't know if he wanted to do a TV show with me. I, 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 I didn't know what it was about. But uh, I spoke with him about getting him on your show, and he said he would do your show. 
uh, what we talked about and what he was fascinated with, uh, and he said, you know, you and Alex Jones are the only ones to talk about it, is uh, the chemtrails, um, the, the uh, loss of freedoms uh, through, through, you know, the music and everything else. He, he believed, he told me that he, want, he believed that everything was going to go digital, uh, music, everything, so that if you uh, irritated the the people in control, they just delete you with a push of a button. And he well, I remember when you said, uh, you know, you talked to Prince and he was a listener, and I'm like, well, I think we tried to reach out to him, but that guy's got so many people around him, hard to get to. But right. Uh, right. these guys need to speak out before their untimely deaths. I tell you, uh, it's very, very sad. But notice he's getting an autopsy, but the Supreme Court Justice... Uh, Anthony Scalia isn't, and now we've got Chelsea Clinton video we're going to play in a moment, man, Cal, uh, who says that now he's out of the way, they can get our guns. Alex, um, I have a lot, I want to say something, and I've been talking about this for years. Um, my friend Andrew Breitbart and I, and you were to be part of that show, as you remember, in fact, we recorded a segment for Fox. Andrew Breitbart was going to do a segment, uh, I'm talking Breitbart and all these other uh, things that he started, you know, the Ariana Huffingtons, all, all these other people that he puffed up on the Internet. And, you know, you would, you would watch Glenn Beck, and all he was doing was reading Breitbart. But Breitbart and I were working on a TV show, and he was going to do a thing on Fox News Channel. And he was going to do a segment called Future News, and he told me that he had video that would bring down Obama, blah, blah, blah. Uh, hours before he was going to release it on my show and, and nationwide, worldwide, uh, he was found dead. And they announced it immediately. Alex, I've been doing this since 1984, 85, okay? I've been doing this for a while. I've never seen anything like it. Michael Jackson, uh, whoever, uh, you know— um, Amy Winehouse, uh, don't, jump to, don't jump to conclusions. We don't know if it was drugs. Wait a minute, what? I've never seen anything like it. When Andrew Breitbart died, they said, uh, dead of natural causes. Within 30 minutes of him being announced that he was dead, they said natural causes. And, and, and now with Scalia, they announced, right. hey, he's dead, natural causes, no autopsy. Yeah, yeah. Listen, listen. And, and, with, and, and then people like me and you demanded an autopsy of, of Andrew Breitbart. And what happened? As the coroner was ready to give the uh, the notice, he the information, he was murdered. So I just find it interesting that as this artist, Prince, and I didn't love all of his music, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not really my genre, but 57 years old, he's talking about chemtrails, he's talking about how they're manipulating our water, how they're turning us into weaklings, how they're numbing us, how they're dumbing us down, how they're turning us into sheeple. Isn't it interesting that as he comes public, as he shows up on my studio and talks to me and mentions he gets a lot of his information from Alex Jones. As all of this is happening, he's dead. Wow. Some people are telling me they think he was murdered. I don't know. Well, I don't know how much of this I can get into. And, and, and why don't you talk about what Billy said on your show? So I don't, his memories all blur what he's told me privately. Well, my, my big surprise was I believed I was going to, you know, Prince came on my show, very quiet, very diminutive, a uh, very intelligent guy. Uh, very smart. Um, you know, these guys, they're, uh, the image is created, you understand. I mean, I also interviewed Kurt Cobain, and, you know, oh, he was an artist. He was tortured. He was all this. Uh -uh. It was all by design. It was an act. It was an act. Uh, he wanted to sell records. He created that image to sell records, that image of not caring. These, you know, Prince, it was an act. It was an act. He borrowed it from James Brown and Little Richard and others, but uh, a, a great artist. Uh, what what particular do you want to talk about what Billy said? Well, I mean, the problem is you know, stuff all mixes together. What's in confidence, what's private, and then I confirmed a lot of stuff he told me from other high-level people. Uh, and, and, and it's just crazy how the elite really want to have top rock stars and, 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 and rappers and other people into their meetings. And, and this type of stuff, you know, I've been invited, uh, not just to speak at Oxford and uh, Cambridge. Um, and then I was told, oh, you've been offered that? That's really the cover for this. Uh, by a high-level person in Hollywood, and then sure enough, it did happen. I um, mean, I've been invited to basically go over and uh, be, a, I mean, eyes wide shut type stuff with real elites, you know. And 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 the listeners are hearing this, and they're going, "Oh yeah, really? No, folks, this is real." That's why Vivian Kubrick, uh, who was the protege of Stanley Kubrick, gave me the only interview she's given in 15 years about all this, and she knew the stuff I'd been through. It, it was, Leanne was there, we were at dinner, and she was literally got down on her knees in front of me. And I was like, what are you doing? She goes, no, listen. She started telling me all this stuff that no one would know. And, and I can't even get into it all. I, I just, I, well, I just well, wish Al the public Alex, knew what was really going on. Alex, Alex, I want to tell you something. Eyes Wide Shut, brother. That movie reveals a lot. Eyes Wide Shut by Kubrick. It's an awful movie. But these parties do happen. Prince talked about these parties, not just with me, but elsewhere. And are you willing, and, and, you know, look, there's a great drug 
that my listeners have and your listeners have. And Alex, hell, you had it and I had it. And that drug is if we only had fame or we only had money or we only had this or that, we'd be happy. And I know, Alex, I know the battles that you've had in your life. And, and, but this, this, this drug, we have sold people this, this idea that, that fame will cure them. And so I understand and people are literally willing to sell their soul for it. You and I haven't. And I want to tell you that Billy hasn't. Uh, there's a reason. How, how about this guy that fills stadiums and, and sells millions and millions of uh, recordings, and yet they, they press uh, uh, lesser stars than Billy? Why does he promote it? Because he wouldn't sell out. Why did Prince disappear? Because he wouldn't sell. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give them his master tapes. Right? What about, uh, what about me and you where, where we do these shows? I'm, I'm reaching you know, two, three million people. You're probably reaching more than that. And yet all we hear about is Anderson Cooper and, and Rachel Maddow, who has you know, a couple hundred thousand people. Because it's all part of the facade, to, but, but I mean, getting back to that. We're not willing to sell out to the agenda. And if you don't do the agenda, you don't get promoted. If you don't have, if you don't, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Well, I don't even want to, <laughs> speaking of Breitbart, I mean, folks at that level now go around in disguises and things. People don't know all this just so they're not known and seen in public because they're getting followed around 24-7. And I don't want to get up here and whine about this stuff to people. They just don't know how real it is till they've experienced it. And I know the circles you've been in, you've experienced even more of this than I have, but I was talking to just even Mark Dice when they were getting ready to give him a national TV show. Oh, he's uh, awesome. With, uh, you know, some of the folks from Montley Crew. He's in the meeting, and the head producer, not with Montley Crew, but with his big TV network, goes, listen, Mark, what's wrong with the devil? What's wrong with Satan? And starts praising Lucifer and, and asking him to join with Lucifer. And the guy was yeah. in a religious experience trying to sell him on it and people just don't understand they don't know what happens next level welcome back to the info wars nightly news i'm leanne mcadoo and i'm joe biggs and this is the info wars nightly news blitz we wanted to let you know there's a lot of other news going on while everyone is preoccupied with this whole transgender bathroom issue. Uh, a little update on the Flint water crisis. Three people have been charged this week. The utili utility administrator who was charged with tampering with evidence, uh, he has been charged, Mike Glasgow, as well as Mike Prisby. He's the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality District Water Engineer. And Stephen Bush, who he's also the water quality supervisor there. Both of them have been charged with two counts of misconduct, one count of tampering with evidence, and another of conspiracy to tamper with evidence. All of these are felonies. So, of course, we're starting to see a little bit of forward motion in this case. But interestingly, um, a lot of Bodies are st starting to pile up there in Flint. A little bit of a uh, some. Yeah, it makes you think about what's like on. what's really going on out there. You already know the uh, the system in Flint's pretty corrupt. Now you have these bodies starting to stack up. What's really going on? Yeah, and so there there is a Flint water treatment plant foreman who was found dead just days before all of these charges were levied against his colleagues. And this is the water treatment plant foreman, Matthew McFarland. He was found dead in his home on April 16th uh, by a friend who went to visit him. And an autopsy was conducted, but there still is no determination of what caused his death. And the authorities are waiting on a toxicology report, but that's not it. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a woman in leading Flint water crisis lawsuit slain in twin killing, and uh, her name is Sasha Vanna Bell, and uh, she was one of the leading people. Uh, she actually, her case was one of 64 lawsuits filed on behalf of 144 children by uh, Stern's law firm in New York. So here you are, you've got a man, 43, he's involved in this, he's dead. You've got this woman who was uh, killed in a twin killing. Something's going on. Yeah, and, and this woman here who was slain, she her, her case played a very important role in the entire um, Flint civil lawsuits because she was one of several who filed actually in Genesee Circuit Court, and then that was transferred to uh, the U.S. District Court, but then they send it back, saying that they didn't have the jurisdiction to oversee it because it was sent to the U.S. Dist District Court by the request of one of the defendants. And so now it got sent back to the Genesee County Court, and so now uh, all other 63 cases have been returned to the state court. So mm -hmm. here, you know... And she said that her baby had lead poisoning as well, and that's kind of what got her involved in this. Yeah. You were there not too long ago. I mean, what was going on when you were in Flint, Michigan? What did you see? I mean, well, it was just a lot of people there who were really devastated by the state of their 
their town. I mean, this was once a thriving city that turns into practically a ghost town. And what I also saw when I was there is that it wasn't only black families who were being affected by this, although it is largely a black population there in Flint, but this was just across the board. People there in those um, older homes there with the lead pipes are all being affected by this. And then just what we've learned in the, the months following, just how deep the cover-up went and how these government officials could be so neglectful to the point uh, these three who have been charged, they, they were sending in improper water samples, trying to say that they were getting samples from the really heavily contaminated homes. Uh, when really they were taking samples from homes that weren't affected by this at all. So were and white people uh, affected by this as well? Yeah. Wow, I mean, I guess Bernie Sanders is wrong again that uh, white people don't know what it's like to be poor. No, oh, yeah, and that's a pretty crazy theory there by that guy. I couldn't even believe he threw that out, especially considering that he was uh, didn't have a job till he was like 40 41. and <laughs> had a dirt floor place for him and his first wife. So... But I don't know, that's what we kind of do here in America now is just completely suspend our reality. Um, now, but switching gears here, we also have another court case going through with some ISIS suspects who were apprehended in Minnesota. These were three American men who were accused of trying to join the Islamic State group. And now we're finding that one of these men uh, says that he wanted to uh, open up routes from Syria to the U.S. through Mexico. And he was going to tell ISIS members about this route so that he could, it could be used to send members to America to carry out these terrorist attacks. And, it, and the interesting thing is, too, you have to read between the lines sometimes, is the main guy that they're, they're talking about here, his name is uh, Omar, last name Omar. He was asked if he was involved in sending troops or people over to Syria to kill American citizens. So they made him the way they essentially, the, question was, yeah, the way they asked the question was, is are you going to kill Americans overseas? And clearly he's already being looked at for bringing Syrians possibly into America. So it was kind of a weird question that they asked this it guy. Like for him to deny yeah, that conspiracy allegation. Conspiracy to kill troops overseas. No, he doesn't want to kill them overseas. He's bringing them here to America to kill them here. Right. We already saw what happened in San Bernardino. We've already gone down to the border. Josh Owens and I went out there. We filmed. We showed you in Arizona. We showed you in El Paso. We've shown you in Laredo just how easy it is to come across the border in Laredo, Texas. Mm -hmm. Josh and I got those uh, guys smuggling drugs over. Those could easily, in those satchels, be chemicals used to make explosives with. We saw with James O'Keefe dressing up like Osama bin Laden crossing the border or in Canada coming into the States with sarin and all these different uh, chemicals, you know, Ebola. It can happen, and it's not ridiculous for us to ask questions. Right. You know, we already know it's a widely known thing around the world that our borders are not secure. Mm -hmm. So it would be crazy for these guys who want to do harm in America to ignore that important free information that they get. You know, hey, they're telling us their weakness. Let's exploit it. Let's use it. Right. Well, and not to mention, I know Breitbart reported about how they're actually now uh, making some agreements with the cartels. And we just saw how they discovered the longest tunnel to ever be discovered going from Tijuana into California. And there they only were able to confiscate a massive amount of, of drugs. But those tunnels could also easily smuggle terrorists through. So not only do we have a porous border, but there's also these underground tunnels that we don't even know where they are all across the country. I mean, once so. again, we're, we're willing to throw our safety away to be politically correct. Well, talking about politically correct, I mean, here we have, and this is our fair and balanced justice system that we've got. It's just so insane. So the, the attorney who's trying to help these three men or representing them, they don't want to allow certain evidence to be uh, pre presented to the jury because they want the jurors to decide without fear and contempt alone. So they want to not put in things that are on their phones, um, phone calls where they have talking about returning to attack the United States, um, saying they watch videos of gruesome images, have uh, the World Trade Center towers, the footage of them burning and falling on their phone, as well as pictures of Osama bin Laden. They don't want that, that presented to the jury because then the jury is going to automatically just... They're not terrorists, you know. They were just thinking about maybe being terrorists. Yeah, going as far as planning routes and contacting other elements outside of the U.S., in order to bring troops and recruit them into our homeland here. That's completely ridiculous. I mean, when you see stuff like that, it's just like, that's the evidence that needs to be presented to the jury that backs up the fact that, hey, all right, these guys are talking about bringing them in. Well, maybe they have this kind of stuff on their phone for a reason because that's what they're involved in. 
Right. Well, and they, I just don't understand the reasoning there when you're trying to, to keep these men from going to prison for life. You know, I just I just don't understand it. But then again, this is uh, America here, and that's why they want to come exploit our uh, judicial system so that they can, you know, plot terror attacks, and then the PC people of this country will forgive them because they're sweet and lovely. But also today... Uh, something else that we've been saying is going to happen, uh, the Obama administration has committed the United States to the Paris Climate Agreement. They've signed the nation onto the document. Uh, John Kerry was there, signed America in today, and then uh, the president will ratify it in December. So it's going to kind of have to go through Congress and this and that, but I'm sure he's just going to use his magic pen to go ahead and ratify this in December, which means whoever is elected next is going to have a really tough time getting the United States out of this agreement. Yeah, I mean, once again, they're using this beard of this whole transgender bathroom discussion to completely go and do this. Over here. Yeah, it's a magician trick. Like, hey, look at this, but this is happening over here. Right. I mean, that's what Obama's been doing. That's. I mean, I, it, it doesn't surprise me when you see that. I mean, sometimes you have to look past the, the propaganda, the BS, and actually try to look at what's going on behind these closed doors. And yeah, I mean, these whenever guys are... you see something crazy like this where all media is either on prints or this, there's something going on, and it's this climate. There, there's, there's a, there's a, they had a, a live thing outside of his home where they were talking about the autopsy. Yeah, well, not for Scalia, though. Not Scalia, yeah. Yeah, that one doesn't matter, and you're racist for even asking about it. Now, a U.N. official uh, has admitted that the U.N. seeks to redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy, and they're calling for centralized transformation. It's going to make the life of everyone on the planet very different to combat the alleged global warming threat. Stick around. There's more news coming up. While mainstream media, the failed propaganda Goliath, desperately wheezes for air, swimming upstream in a raging river of American truth and relevance, the force of the New World Order's establishment mind control is getting bolder. With Justice Scalia on the bench, one of the few areas where the court actually had an inconsistent record relates to gun control. Sometimes the court upheld local and state gun control measures as being compliant with the Second Amendment, and sometimes the court struck them down. They say they believe the next time the court rules on gun control will make a definitive ruling. At this point, it should come as no surprise that government-engineered propaganda was legalized in the United States in 2013, slipped into the tyrannical bulwark NDAA of 2013 while America slept. Yeah, the same NDAA that gives the government the power to detain U.S. citizens suspected of terrorism indefinitely without charge or trial. And considering the fact that the establishment's number one target is domestic terrorists labeled as constitutionalists or patriots, or even documentary filmmakers, that authorization is highly disturbing. They just took them away. Where? Re-education camps, that's what they call it. So it should come as no surprise that the puppets with their perfect hair and hubris-filled blank teleprompter-reading minds are being forced to ratchet up a full-on cannibalistic assault on their own deteriorating journalistic integrity. We should spend more time listening to what others have to say and less focusing on the grammar what they say it with. Supporting mindless disinformation like this. No, we can't be a slave for him. He got me appreciating Obama way more. Hey, Donald, and they ain't one that follows. You gave us your reason to be president. And firing people like ESPN's recent firing of Kurt Schilling over the exercise over what is simply Schilling's free speech. The more this occurs, the more the disgust for mainstream media grows. Investors Business Daily writes, more information travels faster to more consumers than ever before. So why does a new survey show trust in media at rock bottom? Because so much more accurate information is available elsewhere. There is no incongruity in the fact that a new poll conducted by the Media Insight Project, a joint project of the American Press Institute and the Associated Press Center for Public Affairs Research, finds the American media's popularity way down with that of Washington politicians. With 2014 adults surveyed, only 6% expressed a lot of confidence in the press. And in its technological haste to sell meaningless swill through clickbaiting rather than focusing on what people truly want, real verifiable journalistic truth, social media and online journalism 
also created its own hyperactive click trap. TheInformation.com writes, Digital media companies are caught in the crap trap, mass-producing trashy clickbait so they can claim huge audiences and often higher valuations. But that model failed, heralded by mass layoffs. As the crow flies, the days of cable network media being the successful and reliable source of unfiltered information it once was in the archaic past will be as distant a memory as Brian Williams' career. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm not gonna sit here and take it anymore! Oh, didn't expect to see you here. I mean, this is a public restroom after all, but not that public. I didn't expect an audience while I was in here. You know, we've got Donald Trump entering the cultural pissing contest over who can use which bathrooms, and I think you really stepped in it. He has walked that back a little bit, saying that, no, I misspoke when I supported people's rights to use bathrooms wherever they want. There are some jurisdictions here. It should be left to the states. That's what he should have said from the very beginning. He should have said, I'm president. Why are you asking me about bathrooms? I don't have any authority on it. Isn't it pathetic? that we want to have somebody at the very top who is going to dictate everything to us, even where we can go to the bathroom. You know, we talk about boundaries and we talk about borders, and that's one of the things that's made Donald Trump so popular here. There are constitutional boundaries. Now, Donald Trump recognized that today. I still don't see that recognition, though, from Ted Cruz. This is something that should be decided at the states. It is something that should be a private property issue as well. You should not have even the state government intruding on our private property, but it's really about privacy. You know, one of the words for bathroom used to be called privy. We don't use that term too much anymore, but that's essentially what it's about. It's about privacy, about the fact that when I am in here, I don't expect an audience. We have bathrooms because we want to have privacy. It's why we don't go to the bathroom outside, isn't it? But we need to understand that we have to respect those boundaries. And there are security reasons as well, just like we have at the border. There are also security reasons. You know, it's interesting, when I was back in North Carolina, we had a judge who got drunk and he relieved himself outside and he was seen doing that. And he was removed from the bench for indecent exposure. That is now being mandated essentially by our governments, telling people that we are going to open up the bathrooms for everyone, that we're going to let men go to the bathroom in women's areas. As a matter of fact, we have a judge, now, even after we disbarred a judge for indecent exposure, we have a judge now in Virginia who's told the school district there that they are not going to be allowed to have separate boys and girls bathrooms. They're not going to be allowed to have separate showers for boys and girls. So after a judge was removed for indecent exposure for publicly going to the bathroom, we now have a judge who is mandating indecent exposure with our children. That is the brave new world that we're looking at. And when we talk about governments entering into this, violating private property rights, understand that in Arizona, we've just had a bill introduced that would require urinals to be added to ladies' rooms. And along with that, they're going to be having men come into the ladies' rooms, obviously, as well. Now, I will not be using bathrooms like that. And if Donald Trump wants to let Caitlyn Jenner go to any bathroom that he or she wants to go to, and Trump Towers or Target wants to do the same thing, I won't be going to Target. I won't be going to Trump Towers. And you know, I might just boycott the election as well, because we need to understand where these boundaries are. When Ted Cruz comes into it, he's right on the individual issue, but he is wrong to make this a religious issue, to try to pull in and divide the population. People of both sexes, people, whether they're LGBT or whatever, they need to understand that we need to maintain our personal space, our privacy, our decency. When we lose our decency, when we lose the boundaries and the distinctions between men and women, when we purposely try to eradicate those boundary lines, 
We not only put ourselves in danger by allowing sexual predators to enter a private space by just wearing a dress, and I'm not saying that the transgenders are that way. I'm saying sexual predators will masquerade as transgenders. And once they do, and that happens once or twice, they, the transgenders, the LGBT crowd, will never get rid of that stigma. So they've got a dog in this fight as well. They should be maintaining these boundaries. They should be concerned about safety and not mandating indecent exposure. But that's what we're saying. Understand this. We talk about the borders of the country. Donald Trump has said, if you don't have borders, you don't have a country. Well, it's also true within the country. When we destroy the boundaries, when we destroy the borders, the boundaries of decency, the borders of privacy, the boundaries and the restrictions on government authority in our private lives and our private property, we will destroy our family. We will destroy our rule of law. We will destroy everything that is worth having in a country. And that's what you need to understand. We are in danger of losing something that is far greater than merely our sovereignty. It's our decency, our respect for each other as individuals, our privacy, our private property rights, our constitutional law and our constitutional rights. That's the real issue. Renfowars.com, I'm David Knight. Well, that's it for our show tonight. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week. It was almost as if it were a planned implosion. It just pancaked. Well, pancaking almost like a precision implosion. Just reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down.